Let me begin by thanking our featured author and our guests who are all, I'm very happy to say, Columbia Journalism School uh, alumni. Katie Wirth, Rainey Aronson Rath, Jimmy So, and Charles Sennett. And I'd also like to recognize Alex Halliday, founding dean of the Columbia Climate School, and Nick Lemon, director of Columbia Global Reports. I have spoken many times uh, about the founding of Columbia Global Reports five years ago. Nick Lemon and I were concerned that so many newspapers and news magazines were going out of business and that the coverage of global issues was declining largely for financial reasons. Of course, we share in the belief that a vibrant and free press are essential for a healthy society. We also believe that great universities like Columbia have a responsibility to help make the world better outside our own walls. Of course, our graduates do that, as we see here with Columbia Journalism School alumni in every leadership position on this project. But we wanted actually to do the work ourselves too, as an institution. We created Columbia Global Reports to focus attention on stories that we felt didn't receive the coverage they deserved. We were inspired by the journalism being done at leading nonprofit, national nonprofits like Frontline. And over the past several years, we have been gratified by the success of Columbia Global Reports, by the wide variety of topics that have been covered and by the influence our books have had on the national discourse. Tonight's book is an ex excellent example of the kind of work that we set out to do five years ago. And it's an honor to be doing it in partnership with Frontline and the Ground Truth Project. Miseducation, How Climate Change is Taught in America, focuses on a topic that is obviously critical to our future and our survival on this planet. That topic, of course, is climate change and how it is being taught or not taught in primary 
and secondary schools across the United States. Katie Wirth has conducted a multi-year investigation that reveals the extent to which uncertainty, doubt, and denialism have been infused into the education that children in public schools receive around the issue of climate change. She has found that to a significant extent this misinformation is due to the efforts of the oil industry, state legislatures, school boards, conservative lobbyists, and textbook publishers who work to sow doubt and promote distrust on climate science. Given that background, it's little wonder that, as Katie points out in the book, a recent UN survey found that a quarter of young Americans declined to call climate change an emergency. The subject matter here is timely and urgently important. It is very close to my own heart and lies at the core of what we do here at Columbia to create new knowledge, educate future generations, and engage with the problems of the world. Indeed, on the issue of climate change, we felt the challenges were so great and the consequences so potentially catastrophic that we have founded an entire school devoted to climate just a year and a half ago. The Columbia Climate School, our first new school at the university in 25 years, welcomed its first cohort of students at the start of this academic year. These developments complement our longtime academic leadership in climate science and our plans and commitments to shrink our own carbon footprint through our campus operations and investment policies. But the success of our climate school, and indeed of all the efforts underway on climate, depend greatly on the willingness of Americans to understand the gravity of the crisis we face and to embrace efforts to lessen its destructive consequences. If the crisis in climate education outlined in this book continues to be our reality, it will not be possible for the society to make the changes needed to slow the pace of global warming and to mitigate its worst outcomes. We're here to discuss this and much more. So now I will turn this over to Nick Lemon, who will introduce our panelists and begin the discussions. Nick, as most of you probably know, is the director of Columbia Global Reports and Dean Emeritus of the Columbia Journalism School. I am deeply grateful to him for managing this imprint so expertly and for organizing this event. Thank you. Thank you, Lee, um, and welcome everybody. Uh, just to, I, I think your screen looks the same as my screen. So just going clockwise, I'm Nick Lemon, as noted. And then uh, going clockwise for me, you get to Rainey Aronson, who is the executive producer of Frontline. Then uh, Charles Sennett, who is the CEO of Ground Truth. Then Jimmy So, who is um, the editor of Columbia Global Reports. Um, we won't uh, get into um, exactly what year everybody graduated from Columbia Journalism School, but um, I, I think it's fair to say that I'm the oldest person on the screen. So um, when I was uh, 25, I guess, uh, unspecified date, I went to work for the Washington Post, uh, then in its maximal glory days after Watergate. And, you know, that was a world where um, that you, the rest of you probably aren't old enough to remember, where once you landed at a place like that, it was assumed that you had a job for life. And it was kind of like being in the U.S. Foreign Service or something. You'd get posted here for a few years, you'd get posted there for a few years. Uh, at that time, there was a whole floor of the building that was filled with people, uh, little teams of people who had been detached from any deadlines and, and sent to, you know, figure out the big problems of the world. And it was assumed that the paper would always be so profitable that it could sort of finance this, this public function. Well, we're not in that situation anymore. And so I want to use part of this session to introduce Katie Worth's book, but part to show you kind of the new, if you will, before we get to the ecology of planet Earth, uh, we're going to do a little bit on the ecology of nonprofit journalism today to show you how in the 
era that is emerging that isn't the era I was just describing when I was starting at the Washington Post, how work like this gets done, because it is expensive, it does take a village. Um, so we're going to use kind of the origin story of the book as a way of, um, you know, also explaining to you the infrastructure that produces a book like this and how it works. Uh, so we'll do that for a few minutes and then we'll bring on uh, Katie and Alex Halliday. Um, I think the story starts with Charlie, although it's not quite clear who it starts with. Um, but I'll start with you, Charlie. And how did you first encounter Katie Worth and send her to uh, the reporting that began this book? The way I remember it, Katie was already at Frontline working as a, as a reporting fellow. Uh, but we at the Ground Truth Project support uh, journalism in the field. And the idea was sort of put to us, would we be interested in supporting uh, Katie and, and Michelle Meisner, who, did, who was a colleague who had a great idea to go to the Marshall Islands to explore a story that would look at uh, what came to be called in the film they produced, The Last Generation. And working with Rainey on this, it became an opportunity to really think about how we could support these two amazing um, emerging journalists who are fully emerged at this point. This is the, these are spectacular talents um, early in their careers, but, but truly veterans of the craft and who are amazing at what they do. They went in and found very compelling stories. And then there was a process of stepping back from that trip and trying to figure out how to pull this together, which is where Rainey and Frontline and the amazing work the team at Frontline does conceptualizing this. So. I could maybe come back to where it went from there, but Rainey, this this the conceptualization of the last generation was well, where right, we started to come together. One of the things that you just mentioned is the new ecosystem of journalism and, and the big central idea being collaboration. So Charlie and I long wanted to collaborate, and that's true with you too, right, Nick? So we're all thinking, how do we put our journalism together to do stronger investigative journalism, all of which is incredibly expensive and takes time. So when we were pitched the idea at Frontline for the team to go to the Marshall Islands, the first person I thought of was Charlie, because he was always saying to me, let's do something together. And I think that enthusiasm really led us to support their work at the Marshall Islands. They came back and Katie Worth and Michelle Meisner are terrific, as Charlie said, and they started to show us scenes from what they hoped to be a documentary film. And as they showed it to us, what was remarkable is that what they really captured were children's voices. They captured the youth of the Marshall Islands expressing in very vivid detail their experiences, their belief in climate science, their belief in climate change because they were living it. And as they started to talk, I actually said in the edit room, and Charlie knows this, you know, I think as a documentary film, um, you know, we're going to have to have all these adult experts around these children. And what might be better is to just hear from the children themselves, because it's such a persuasive argument. It's such a persuasive uh, moment to hear a child really talk about change through their eyes. And that we would put the addendum materials, the writing around it about climate science and climate change in an interactive. And that's how we came up with The Last Generation. And and Charlie and the team at um, Ground Truth, the editors there, you know, it was actually a really synergistic moment because we're filmmakers at Frontline and visual storytellers and, of course, journalists, too. But I think that collaboration really lent itself to what then became, you know, this big effort around a book. Let me go. Well, first of all, just for the uninitiated, you'll see this in the book. I, I sometimes my children drag me to these fantasy adventure type movies. They always have a scene on an island, and the island is, always has these sheer cliffs awesome. rising up out of the sea. That's not the Marshall Islands. So the reason the, for the Marshall Islands and a climate change story is they're very low lying and they're receding rapidly and, and to the point of uh, being in sight of not existing anymore. So it's those kinds of islands. Um, I think the way this whole saga started was Katie went to Columbia Journalism School. She was a student of mine. I was her thesis advisor. Um, and somewhere along the line, I 
called Rainey, I believe, and said, I have a really extraordinary student and you've got to find work for her. This was yeah. pre this project. I mean, um, and those circles really came together with a fellowship that she started to do with us in the first place, which then led me, of course, to call you with the idea of a book. You know, yeah, in that, so it, it all all goes around. comes together, mm -hmm. but that's the point about collaboration when the editorial, editorial standards and relationships are trusted editorial relationships. That's when this really important, profound journalism can take off. And, and that was exactly what happened here, Nick, is that we called you to say, you know, Katie Worth has this remarkable idea of looking at what do American children know about climate? And Charlie was on board for that. But we couldn't make a film because it was in the middle of COVID and distressingly we couldn't. So I said to her, why don't you write a book? And then the next call was to you all. Um, and I think that was that was the, the grace of, you know, good editorial judgment that that we were able to talk about that pretty quickly. Nick, yeah, I might, nice. if, if I could, I would just add one other beautiful circle that that comes into this, which is a long time ago you made a similar call to me about Marissa Miley, uh, who was the editor on this project, graduate of Columbia J School, I believe is on, on with us today listening in. She became such an incredible advocate of this project, really saw what Katie had and what she wanted to do and the level of research that was here that could really open up into this idea for a book to take it even further and that it encompassed something that at Ground Truth we, we are looking for all the time in narratives, which is stories that are global and local, that bring you the big global stories, but give you a way to tell the narratives and to ground them back into local. So I, just too great an opportunity not to do a shout out to Marissa Miley yeah, on this. You, you just heard it. <laughs> um, and Jimmy, can you talk a little bit about how you find book projects and how you work with authors? Yeah. Well, we operate almost in between a magazine and a traditional book publisher. So we meet with authors, you know, many times a week. And right now, we're actually able to meet in person with authors again. Um, during the pandemic, it had to be over Zoom calls. But we do the commissioning as well as we, you know, we're not a traditional book publisher uh, in that you know, not like a trade publisher who publishes 200 books a, a year. We do six short books a year, so we can give each book special attention and focus one after the other. And so we don't, uh, you know, it's it's not like an agent will will have a long standing relationship with us and will funnel 50 authors to us and uh, and we don't participate in kind of uh, book auctions and buy manuscripts that are, are finished. So we're really sort of assigning and commissioning. This is one of the, this is one of the um, projects that is an exception in that it's, the proposal came thanks to Charlie and, and Rainey, came almost fully formed and Katie was almost, always second guessing herself, you know, which happens a lot with debut authors. And I was thinking, well, what if, you know, well, is this going to be uh, too outdated? Are we going to get scooped? I'm afraid of this. I'm afraid of that. And uh, there was just an easy, simple job for me to say, nope, calm down, Katie. This is a great idea. You already have the pieces in here. And a lot of it is because we are a, a part of a nonprofit uh, journalism organization, just like the Ground Truth Project and Frontline, in that I've worked in newspapers, TV, radio, online, magazines. <laughs> I've worked in everything. And Columbia Global Project, Columbia Global Reports is one of the only projects that allow me to not worry about the onslaught of news and information, how we're chasing Twitter and how we're chasing real time digital news nowadays. Um, and we're able to think ahead and think about what's out in front uh, and think about, you know, we wanna get ahead of the news. And this was an opportunity when Katie came to us and Michelle came to us with this and 
all I had to say is, you know, don't worry. This is going to be a good book and a good story two years from now. I'm going to start segueing to our next segment. So we're, I want to say one thing and then we'll uh, disappear. The guests will disappear. I'll still be on the screen and then Katie and Alex Halliday will reappear. So going back to my long ago, younger days, uh, you know, in those days, if you worked for a for-profit news organization and anybody said to you, I'd like to have a little chat with you about how the resources are created to fund your organization, you would say, oh, no, I can't even be in a room when that's just being discussed. That would, you know, corrupt my purity as a journalist. Okay, so counterintuitively, that's what life was like in the glory days of the for-profit journalism world. In the nonprofit journalism world, I can speak for my colleagues, we're all fundraising in addition to making journalism. And I, I just want to stress that um, this is a great ecosystem and the, this book is a great example of the kind of thing it can produce, but it does take a lot of it, us and it does take funding. And so one should uh, be mindful of, you know, we're not the corporate media, we need help. And we're very grateful to those who do help us. Um, any final comments before we switch modes, Charlie? Nick, uh, thanks for, for saying that. I would say the one thing I was thinking when you were sharing your story of the Washington Post was before great reporters ended up in those hallways of the Washington Post, they often started at smaller newspapers around the country that were once thriving. And I worked in a couple of those, the Bergen Record um, or big regional papers uh, like the Boston Globe, which was once a big national paper. And seeing that that landscape shrink in my journey through this industry for like more than 30 plus years, I, I can't believe where we are, where we have a real crisis in local news that I think is directly tied to sometimes the crisis we feel in our democracy. So Ground Truth tries to answer that by supporting two big programs we have, Report for America, which is like Teach for America for Journalism, Report for the World, which is like the Peace Corps. We're trying to say, how do we support really talented reporters to get out there on the field uh, and, and to tell those stories? And I cannot tell you how much Katie embodies that, that sense of, of global and local storytelling. She was such a great local reporter, as well as understanding the real challenges, the global challenges of climate change. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody. And now we're going to flip us three of the four of us on the screen will disappear i'll stay on and then new guests will come on so thanks very much for being with us on this segment of the show okay uh there are can you no you're not seeing them yet uh there's the cover of of katie's book i want to uh just, just highlight one thing we we believe in not uh, publishing the kind of book that you can use as a murder weapon um, or that you have in a pile on your bed table and never read. So you, you're seeing the cover. I want to show you how thick they are. There we go. See? So um, these are books that uh, we publish to be read and, and that we think um, you should be able to read on a good long plane flight or maybe two. Um, and that's that's definitely part of what what we're trying to do. We're um, uh, among the nonprofit news organizations. Columbia Global Reports is one of the few that actually sells a product to consumers, namely our books that wouldn't pay all of our bills. But it's a good discipline for us to publish things that are fun to read and that people really uh, should read. Um, I uh, OK, now we're ready to to go on with the next part of the show. So uh, welcome Katie Wirth, who's on the top of the screen, and Alex Halliday, who's on the bottom of the screen. Um, I'll introduce Alex first and then introduce Katie by way of getting into this book. Um, Alex um, is uh, actually Sir Alex Halliday and has spent most of his career in Great Britain, where he's from, uh, as a distinguished geologist and scientific administrator, and came across the ocean to Columbia to direct 
our Earth Institute um, several years ago and is now the founding dean of the Climate School, um, which I hope we'll get a chance to talk about. Katie um, comes from California and, as I mentioned in the first segment, was a student of mine. I was her thesis advisor. Um, the first time she we met, she sort of got my attention by saying, did you know that uh, uh, you can't trust DNA evidence in criminal cases? And I said, really? Um, and that became her thesis. Um, but she, she has a quality of not writing about what everybody else is writing about, but plowing new ground and also of taking, you know, things that people assume and sort of saying not so fast. Um, so Katie, we talked a little bit in the first segment about your trip to the Marshall Islands, but let's start with sort of how you get from there to Oklahoma. Yeah, so from, um, so one of the kids that we featured in our interactive The Last Generation was um, a kid named Iserman. He was nine years old and he could just speak so fluently about climate change, um, its causes, its effects, what it might mean for his future, which is, you know, more than most adults that I know can say. Um, and uh, he wasn't alone. There were plenty of other kids that were like that. And it was because, um, you know, the adults in, the, in his life were talking about it. And he was learning it in school. He had learned it every year since he was six. So um, he and his family, well, his family were, was thinking of moving to Oklahoma um, because in part, because his parents wanted to make sure he got the best education possible. Um, and so that raised this question, okay, well, if he moves to Oklahoma, what will he learn in school about climate change? And what are American kids learning about it? Because certainly they don't seem to be as fluent about it as Iserman was. Uh, and that was sort of the animating um, question of this reporting um, and uh, got, got the reporting started. And so, you know, without ruining the suspense of the book, what did you find when you asked the question, what are kids in American public schools uh, learning about climate change? Well, um, first of all, I found that there's just a ton of tension, uh, lots of points of friction over this issue. So, you know, teachers disagreeing with other teachers, parents mad that their kids are learning about it, not learning about it students pushing back on it. Um, pretty much every school that I went to, uh, which were a few different, few dozen schools across the country, uh, there was some story of that, that tension. And um, secondly, we found that there is kind of a striking red-blue divide. Um, so you can kind of, uh, you can kind of roughly say guess what a kid might be learning about climate change based on whether they live whether this their state's legislature is run by republicans or democrats um so it's it's a big question and it's a little imponderable but you know we're used to there being opposition to remedies of climate change around the world based on people's economic situation. You know, I'm a coal miner and I want to keep my job, that kind of thing. This doesn't seem to have the same economic stakes. So who are the people who don't want uh, it taught that climate is changing? I mean, I would argue that they're that the, sor the source of the doubt actually was very much economic. So, you know, climate denial didn't sprout out of the atmosphere fully formed, you know, it, it appeared because there was a real concerted effort um, and a real campaign to promote doubt um, by the fossil fuel industry, because in fact, they have trillions and trillions of dollars at stake, you know, if they um, stop drilling tomorrow versus in 30 years, that's a matter of a great deal of money for them. And so through the 90s and into the 2000s, they funded millions and millions of dollars of to push doubt into the American public's mind. And part of that campaign actually was directed at schools. 
Um, and to this day, they still have um, efforts to get me their messages in schools. Um, so it's, you know, but then it sort of took on a life of its own, the right wing media machine and local politics kind of got the, the doubt spread didn't stay in the fossil fuel industry, it spread. But, you know, there's also a strain you bring out in the book of um, way back before this was an issue that we were concerned about, of a sort of hostility to science teaching in, in American public schools. So could you talk about that a little bit? Um, yeah, I think, you know, it was just so interesting to look back at the history of how evolution was taught in, um, in schools. Uh, I think that's what you're getting at. Yes, um, right. So, you know, there was a, a long time when, um, you know, teachers really had to tiptoe around evolution and textbook makers removed it from their books, even though it was the organizing principle of biology. Um, but you wouldn't know that if you went, if you took, you know, public school classes for much of the 20th century. And so, you know, that history is sort of informative. It, it informs uh, what happens today. So, you know, textbook makers are well aware that climate change is a sticky issue. And so they use this, they kind of preemptively are very careful about how they, um, how they talk about it and use very doubtful language. So it's sort of like, um, you know, they're, t they're giving information about climate change, but then they're sort of undermining it with, um, with kind of doubtful language to, to please the folks who might not want it in there. Um, Alex, let me turn to you for a couple of uh, questions. First, just the most fundamental question, uh, why does climate education matter? <laughs> so that's a good question. So I'd just like to kick off by congratulating Katie on an amazing book. I mean, this is this is such a great read. And um, as I said earlier, um, I'm not a very good person in terms of focusing my attention on a book from cover to cover, but this one does it. It's really astonishing. And it's, and it's because of the granularity of the um, investigative journalism she's thrown into this. It's really, really impressive. So um, big thanks to Katie for doing this piece of work. Uh, in terms of climate education, you can hardly think of anything more important right now than uh, the younger generations who are going to feel the most and experience the most of the climate crisis going forward and who have got most, more to lose than anybody should know as much as possible about the climate crisis, climate change, science, and the difficulties of the problem, because it is a very, it's a wicked problem to try and solve. And, uh, you know, what's great, of course, about young people is many of them are actually expressing their own anger, concern about uh, the fact that um, things aren't moving fast enough. And so, the idea that you might actually somehow, um, rather than actually listening to young people and their concerns about this, instead try and change what they're being taught uh, and perpetrate uh, what is really misinformation in this way um, for profit is just disgusting. And I'm quite sure that there are plenty of other examples of it, but actually uh, this is such a massive problem for society uh, that's bad now, and it's going to get much worse going forward, uh, that we we have to really take it so seriously. I'm just, I've am just i just come back from COP in Glasgow, and the most exciting part of that was meeting with young people by far. I mean, there's some wonderful people I met with from around the world. But um, it's the young people who've got the the real focus on on trying to do something about this. They care about it. They're passionate. They're very, very smart and they're energized to try and um, change things. I met one um, woman from Germany who's probably 25 years old, I think, something like that, who'd taken the German government to, to court and won uh, over their attitude to climate change. There is a, these are seriously exciting and energized individuals who are having an amazing leadership role. And we need to provide these people with the facts. We need to provide them with the evidence. And this is so important in our education systems going forward. In the case of America, I think there are, I mean, quite apart from the, um, 
the issues of the way in which um, education has been uh, infiltrated um, to bad effects, to kind of evil effect in some ways. Um, there's also just the incredible fragmentation of the education system that you get in America, which makes it really hard to take a, a national view of this, which I think is, um, which is a major disadvantage from the point of view of combating them, as uh, combating this speedy points out uh, with the red versus blue states in particular. Could you speak a little bit about what happens at the Earth Institute and the Climate School uh, regarding climate education for, for you know, graduate students and younger people too? Yeah, so the Climate School, um, the Earth Institute has been around for 25 years and it brings together people from across Columbia who are interested in climate, but also other areas of sustainability. And we've pioneered a number of fabulous um, education programs that are now um, emulated around the world, and actually, which is great. Uh, and so there are a number of people around the world teaching sustainability in their universities based on what Columbia pioneered. So it's a great, great that we did that. But actually, I think with the increasing focus on the climate crisis in particular, um, President Bollinger raised the issue of what more could we possibly do? And in the case of um, most American universities, uh, the most powerful organizations in a university uh, are very often the schools. And so building a school is a very strong statement. It's the first school we've had in 25 years. Um, and it's a, a massive undertaking, but it actually does mean we think this problem is of the same scale and magnitude as say 100 years ago when there were public health emergencies and we started to build the first schools of public health in London and New York and other places. So this is the kind of thing that I think is going to be needed around the world. We're going to need to build these up going forward. But it's partly around, of course, educating future leaders, uh, but it's also around informing the public and connecting with um, both um, um, K through 12, uh, but also K through gray. And I think this is the sort of way in which we're viewing this opportunity as something we, we have to do. Um, and of course, here in New York, we have great opportunities for that. There's a, there's a, there is lots of interest in it. And um, we can actually have, I think, quite a very, quite a positive impact in particular on the local education community and help teachers with what they need to do. Katie, I want to go back to the book. And um, can you tell the story of when you went back to uh, Chico Junior High School, where you went as a student many years ago, a few years ago, let's say? Yeah, um, I, uh, so I had, I was home uh, for a visit and doing some other reporting. And I was just wondering what was being taught in my own alma mater, Chico Junior High School, um, and I reached out to some science teachers there and wound up talking to one uh, sixth grade science teacher who took a lot of care to teach her sixth graders something about climate science, including doing some solutions projects and, um, and you know, like both the science and the solutions. Um, and then one day, her kids, her students started coming in and being like, well, why are we even doing this? This isn't, this isn't important. And she came to find out that the kids were leaving her classroom and going into history class where the teacher was showing them YouTube videos um, from a denialist organization that said that climate change was a hoax and um, that it was a scientific, you know, fraud, et cetera. And so the kids were getting both of those messages and she wound up confronting the, the history teacher and saying, you know, we have to be careful. You know, these kids are 11 and right now one adult they trust is telling them one thing and another adult is telling them, oh, don't worry about it. Um, and he said, well, I just want them to know both sides. And then what's going on outside the walls of the school? Well, yeah, so I, so I grew up in Chico, which is in the same county as um, Paradise, which um, famously burned to the ground in a mega fire in 2018 um, and displaced about 30,000 people, uh, many of them into, uh, into 
into Chico. And so um, there were students in that class, in those classes that were displaced by a fire and could arguably be described as climate refugees. Um, this may be unanswerable, but you could speculate. Why did um, the denialism become such a big conservative cause? It's sort of easier to understand the oil companies and and why, why do they care so much about about pushing back on this? You know, I, it's a really good question. Um, and I don't, I wish I had more insight into that. Um, what I can say is that, you know, it has become a really a, a central pillar of the conservative of the Republican Party stance. And that that, you know, then means that the uh, you know, a large part of the country just doesn't believe this basic scientific fact that is very relevant right now, you know, very and then relevant. that, you know, and then that those adult politics just like insert themselves into the domain of children, into the world of children, um, you know, through teachers who just kind of trust the information that they've been given um, through their parents. Um, and so, yeah, you know, like, so that, that leads to the situation where kids are learning, um, you know, learning, uh, inf or get, getting messages that aren't based in evidence. What do you think would help to solve this problem? Well, um, the teachers that I talked to, the kind of climate educators said that they want, they wanted, um, they thought it would be important to get into the academic standard, to work on the academic standards state by state and school by school. So academic standards, it's a little tricky to talk about because people's eyes glaze over, but it's, um, they're basically, you know, what a kid must learn uh, each year and each, each grade. So, you know, in seventh grade, um, they may learn uh, fractions, say. Um, and so, it's sort of the a given state's main lever of power over what a kid learns. And so, you know, one of the things that I looked at in my reporting was where in the country uh, kids were, where, where in the world country were, was climate change in the standards and kids were mandated to learn about it and where it wasn't. And so there's many states where it's either not included in the standards or it's included very slightly or it's included like as a debate, you know, they specifically say kids need to debate whether it's happening. So working on those academic standards is one, one point of um, pressure that could, that could change this. I want to say that in a couple minutes, we're going to start taking questions from uh, the audience. Um, so if I assume this isn't set up so I can see them yet, but I will be able to soon. But if you have questions, please uh, send them in and, and then we'll start. I'll start sort of pitching them to Katie and Alex. Alex, um, I have uh, a lot of students who don't c come from the U.S. And they always have this list of um, things that are weird about our country, like people are allowed to walk around carrying guns, and uh, we investigate uh, politicians' uh, religious and sexual lives and things like that. Um, but I assume that something that struck you as odd in this book is that the U.S. doesn't have central control over over the education system. Is that? Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Either, either or both. Yeah. So I was just going to say, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, it's like it's, it is a very strange thing when you think of this as being such an important part of the future of your country that you don't can't actually organize it. I mean, I guess it's probably true in other federal countries as well. Um, but I do think there's a there's another facet to this that I think is quite important. That is that if you look back um, probably just 15 years in the UK, the BBC, when they were reporting on climate change, if there was something about climate change, they would feel compelled to come up with a balanced perspective. And there was this narrative that they had to include somebody who maybe was a climate skeptic alongside somebody who was trying to explain things in terms of climate change. 
And this has now changed, but for, for even quite recently, this was the case. And it was because um, they didn't want to be accused of biased reporting. And it's the same thing a little bit with um, the, uh, the scientists. They're very, very careful not to sound like they're um, overhyping things following the East Anglia Climate Gate um, right. uh, event that took place in um, uh, the early in 2000s. And, you know, this was actually something that actually left scientists feeling they had to be very, very careful not to overhype things while at the same time having to say that things are actually uncertain. And now, of course, what we talk about instead of uncertainty is risk rather than uncertainty. And we talk about things in a much more uh, compelling way because we've got much more data out there. But it's been quite a long haul to actually get even um, certain parts of the media to get on board with the magnitude of the climate crisis and what we have to do. So um, I think that's also part of the context of, of what all countries have been dealing with. Katie, you were going to say? Um, no, I think you, you said it well. Yeah, it is very interesting. This survey that the UN did earlier this um, year looked at what people of all generations um, believe about climate change, uh, you know, in many different countries. And the U.S. definitely had the lowest um, mm. belief in it uh, to, compared to any other country in North America or um or Western Europe at all generations, across all generations. And yeah, we have this system that puts the power in the hands of local governments and state governments, and there's reasons for that, but it means that when, you know, when there are things, problems, it can't, there aren't very easy federal solutions to them. Yeah, you may not know, Alex, there was a massive effort in the last few years to set up a national curriculum called Common Core that seems to have failed, um, basically because of conservative opposition, some opposition on the left as well. Uh, one other comment before we go to questions is what you were saying about the BBC. We're, we're in the middle of a real norm change in the United States around in journalism, around those issues. Um, mm -hmm on issues like climate, on issues like race relations, other things, the journalists are moving away from the idea that you must quote both sides and present their them as equivalently true. And, and certainly we teach our students, try to find the truth of the situation. Don't be guided by your prior, prior assumptions, but if you come to an earned conclusion about what the truth is, you can say that in your story. Um, anyway, I'm going to go to questions. Uh, so we have a um, class here uh, from uh, uh, John O'Connell High School in San Francisco. And so I'm going to start with uh, a few questions from one of the students in the class named Bernardo. Um, what is the process of climate change? What is the aftermath? How is climate change affecting the younger generations? And either or both of you can answer that if you wish. Katie, do you want to go or shall I go? Please do. Okay, so um, climate change is a result of increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is varied naturally over geological time. Uh, but what we're doing right now, because of CO2 emissions from, uh, from caused by the Industrial Revolution and our everyday processes of life, is driving climate change at a pace that's never been done before. And it affects everybody. Everybody's going to be impacted. The result is going to be catastrophic for certain parts of the world. And I think most climate scientists are you know, worried about the direct impact, uh, fair enough, but there's also worries about what it'll do for society. And we'll see societal breakdown in various parts of the world uh, as people struggle to cope with this going forward. So it is arguably the biggest uh, threat we face uh, going forward, and we have to act on it quickly. Let me read a question from James Baker. Um, how can we learn or in slash investigate 
how climate change is currently being taught in the school district in which we live. <coughs> Excuse me. My children are no longer in our public school system. Are you recommending that we become activists on this issue in our own communities? Um, you know, I think uh, it is interesting to find out what's happening in your own school district. Um, and I can't recommend that you become an, an activist on it, but I think it's a reasonable question. What is happening in the schools in your community and your state? Um, there's an organization called the National Center for Science Education, and they track very closely these bills that come up every year um, that try and kind of mess with how climate change and, and often evolution are taught in a given state. Um, and so they're a really good organization to um, to take a look at if you're trying to keep, you know, kind of keep, figure out what's happening in your state. Um, and I think that, you know, like ultimately there does need to be conversations in our communities about, you know, what, what we want, how, how we want to arm um, kids for their future. I, if I could just add on the activist issue, on many issues in the United States, for complicated reasons, um, there's a historic liberal impulse to seize the high ground, um, the major institutions, and try to get change that way. And uh, conservatives are more inclined often to work at the grassroots. I mean, there's nothing that takes more patience than just showing up at local school board meetings year in and year out and making a pain of, of yourself. But a lot of conservative activists around the country have done this for decades. And, and that's what we see now is the result of that. So I think if, if there's more counterbalance where people on the other side go to the same local school board meetings in Tuesday and whenever they are, and show up and question and demand, um, you know, people listen to that. That's just my editorial. Uh, a question from Joyce Lamaster. Doesn't a teacher's curriculum have to be pre-approved by the school board? Uh, I think that varies district to district. Um, the process, as I understand it, is, you know, usually a state will create these academic standards that kind of give the overview of what has to be learned by the end of the year. But it doesn't necessarily say how it should be learned or what, you know, what books it should be using um, or what resources should be used. And so, you know, sometimes school board, school districts have some say in that, um, but a lot of it is a teacher kind of figuring it out on them on their own. And that's one of one problem is that they often go to, you know, go online and just, you know, I have to teach a, a lesson on energy tomorrow and Google sixth grade energy lesson, you know, like they're just trying to kind of put it together themselves and they may run into these free snazzy looking online lesson plans that are um that are actually created by um kind of moneyed interests that are trying to prep push push an um a narrative um so it is it's not there's not uh, like a very clear answer to that i think it really depends on it, you know education is just so local in this country um here's a question from pat ferris what was the most surprising insight you gained from your research? Hmm. Well, um, you know, I think that I found it really interesting, surprising. I think a lot of people would find it surprising how just the quantity of climate denial talking points that are in textbooks, you know, like we think of textbooks as these authoritative sources um, and they really um, you know, like they can be trusted and then you actually look at the what's what is actually written in them about this really, you know, sensitive subject and it's it's not the it's not the truth. It's not what was known at the time about the issue. And that to me I think is pretty shocking. Here's a, another question from Peggy Hartog. I teach sustainability in my critical reading and writing college course. I have found my own resources, but I wonder if you have a list of resources I could use to teach, and that could be for either of you. 
if they, you know, if she'd like to send me an email, we'd be very happy to sort of pull something together. That'd be great. There's, there's plenty out there. There's an organization or there's a website. I think it's called cleanet.org, um, C L E A N E T.org. And they have kind of, they've actually surveyed more than 30,000 online materials about climate change. And they found just 700 of them um, valid and worth using in school. So that, that statistic alone is <laughs> pretty stunning. But um, they have put them all in one place. Um, and so I think that's a really uh, good and reliable resource. Here's a question from Stephen Tucky. Um, given the decentralization of it, given that the decentralization of education is not likely to change and the politicization of science education standards in many states. Is there any reason to expect any improvement in this situation? I guess I'd, I question whether um, things might not change with climate change when we see what's happening to the Western US and uh, Western North America two years in a row um, with wildfires and a drought that is the worst for hundreds of years. And we can tell that from tree ring records. We know that, and we're not through with it yet. These are starting to have big impacts on America. And so, and then of course, there's the Eastern seaboard, Southern seaboard, where we've got the hurricane seasons. And, you know, in New York, we had, um, you know, three and a half inches of rain in one hour fall on Central Park, and it was a record. Nobody's ever seen like that. You can't actually even prepare a city for that kind of amount of rainfall in such a short period of time. But the amazing thing is the previous record was set 10 days previously. And so this is just, things are changing fast. And people, are, nobody had seen anything like Hurricane Harvey before. As the climate changes, the phenomena are, changes, are changing, and people are waking up, I think, to the fact that this is really real. And so I do think there is, that people are gradually, you know, gonna be changing their opinions about this. I, I wanna say also, just as a journalist, that, um, you know, we all operate in the belief that when you bring situations to the public's attention, it makes a difference. And yeah. what Katie has done here is uh, this this really hasn't been as much climate journalism as there is. This really hasn't been a story. She's making it a story, and I don't know, you know, if that's going to lead instantly to a solution. But it sure is a step on the path. Um, so I think just for for this to be an issue that the public understands is an issue and starts to debate is is a first step toward change. Um, a number of people. Um, have, have asked other questions about resources, and I know uh, that you both have the answers. So I, I'd like to say to them, you know, Katie will talk to Jimmy So, who you saw earlier, and, um, and they'll maybe put some of these resources up on our uh, Columbia Global Reports website so you can find them. Um, and, you know, we can work with you, too, on, on that, Alex. That's uh, globalreports.columbia.edu. Um, maybe have time for one more question. Um, it seems to me, this is from April Fletcher. It seems to me the source of misinformation about climate change in schools is ultimately coming from the fossil fuel industry. How can we best put pressure on these companies that are promulgating misinformation for corporate to stop the lies and misinformation? At some level, um, I think one of the most important bits of pressure that's being put on them is um, finance. The, the finance, main financiers uh, that support fossil fuel industry are starting to turn around and actually and partly because they you know they're looking at their investments and wondering whether these are really reliable investments in the future so um and then there are also the stakeholders who are actually shareholders in the companies who are also causing companies to change their mind and then there are certain governments who are also causing certain companies to change their mind 
So there's definitely been a turning, a big turn in the last year or two in terms of pressure on the oil and gas industry to, to move. Uh, you would say not far enough. We couldn't even get agreement to phase out fossil uh, coal in the, in the COP agreement uh, that we've just come away from. Um, there was, we're moving in the right direction, but we're nowhere near far enough. And so there's, there's a, a ton further that has to happen. And I think we have to see this as something that we need to um, just increase the, the level of public engagement on and global engagement on um, going forward, including young people. Well, right at the end of the program, Katie, Alex, any parting words for our audience before we sign off? Well, I, my passing, parting, parting words would be congratulations, Katie, on a brilliant book. I think she's done an amazing job. I found it so interesting to see this taken apart and, and uh, analyzed in such detail. Um, but also, I think the um, there, are, there are some other aspects to this that I'd like to see analyzed in more detail, in particular, the whole way in which um, policy has been influenced over the years, which is very closely allied to what's been going on in education programs, um, how policy is um, deliberately being um, manipulated uh, in the same direction. And there should be a thorough investigation of that um, as well, I think. So Katie, maybe that's your next project. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just wanna say, um, like somebody said it in eight words, what a good climate education would look like. And um, that is that, it's uh, it's real, it's us, it's bad, and there's hope. And if a kid walks out of uh, their education knowing those four facts, um, then they're doing better than most adults in this country. And, um, and you can't forget that last one, that there's hope, uh, because if you just give kids all doom and gloom, then that's not going to serve anyone very much. Um, you need to let them know that there, there are solutions and that they can be part of it. And so um, I think that's, that's just kind of the guidance that I heard from teachers around the country that are doing work on this issue um, about how to approach this issue. And it's, um, I think it's worth thinking about. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, thanks for writing this book and uh, it's really going to make a difference. And in addition to the idea you put forth uh, just now, Alex, we have several other climate books in our pipeline editorially, so stay tuned. And thanks, Rainey, Jimmy, Charlie, and Alex as well for being with us. Um, we'll do more of these, so, so keep an eye on us. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank Bye. you.